1971, the troubles have really kicked off. I'm a student in Belfast, and um, it, Belfast was getting regularly bombed. But anyway, I've arranged to meet my girlfriend on the corner of the city hall, ah, just there. And uh, I'm a student, I've got a large satchel on my shoulder full of books. My girlfriend Liz is a student nurse, and she arrives late, and I'm pacing round and round and round. Uh, she arrives and she's got a large satchel on her shoulder and we start to dander across town. We're meeting friends on the other side of town and uh, Liz is doing a lot of window shopping. We get to one arcade, an arcade that you can walk in and walk out of and we're in there and suddenly we hear a large commotion. Screaming at tires, slamming at doors, running at feet and we walk out and see we are enclosed by these. <laughs> Big time, and a lot of soldiers in between, and they're all pointing their guns at us. Help. <laughs> it felt like help. Uh, the yellow does put your hands against the wall. The back's falling off. <laughs> put, your, put your hands against the wall, put your feet out, don't touch those bags. Uh, some couple of them approach us. <laughs> a couple of approaches, and they do a full body search, a full bag search. Nothing. We're students, our bags are full of books. It should be the end of the story, but they didn't tell anybody they'd searched us. They didn't tell any security services they'd searched us. It happened twice more before we got to where we wanted to go. <laughs> it wasn't as bad as the first time, but it wasn't very pleasant. Much more guns. Um, next story. A couple of years later, I'm <coughs> I've got no pictures for this one. Uh, I no longer work with Liz, I've got another girlfriend. It's very relevant that this girl, called Maureen, is a Catholic and I'm a Protestant. And it's a very dangerous thing to be in Northern Ireland, in Belfast especially. If you meet the wrong place, the wrong person at the wrong time, you surely get a bullet in the back of the head. But anyway, we live in a flat on the Antrim Road, which is North Belfast. And uh, we're out, it's just not very far from a bad area, which is a no-go area. And um, we arrive home on a Saturday night, I get out of the car, and just when I got out of the car, there's a man comes out of the shadows on the passenger side and puts a gun over the roof of the car. Now, I've been scared before, but I mean, I was now unbelievably scared, and my stomach turned to jelly. What do you want? Get in the car. Okay, I get in the car, he gets into the back of the car behind the passenger seat, and I said, what do you want? And I turned around and he said, you're taking me to a petrol station to buy cigarettes and I'm going to tell you where to go after that. Okay, I see he put the gun on the floor of the car. Okay, he's not going to shoot me when I'm driving. Um, we're driving, I know in this scenario I'm not brave, but I know that if you wait till this is finished in Northern Ireland, you'll die. You know, it was, that was it. You know, um, so I thought, I've got to do something before we get to the end. He tells me to drive up the Antrim Road to a garage. I said, if I turn right here, there's a garage much, much closer. Uh, I'm okay, I know there's a large police station in this road. We get to the police station, I do an emergency stop to end the emergency stop. Warren has not had her seatbelt off, I've got my steering wheel to brace me. He thumps into the back of the passenger seat. Hopefully I've stunned him. Hopefully the gun has slid up underneath the, you know, the seat. I yell at Maureen, get out, get out! I don't get out. I open the door and I roll out, thinking I'm going to be less of a target. We run into the police station. Maureen's white, she's shaking, I'm shaking. I, I can still feel the fear telling you the story. And I, I say to the policeman, there's a man in the back of the car He's got a gun. He said he wanted me to drive him to a petrol station to get cigarettes. And he says, I'll tell you where to go after that. There was utter silence. And you could see the police. It seemed like a long time, but it probably wasn't. You could see the policeman gathering himself to tell us. And he took a deep breath and he says, ah, that would be Paddy. <laughs> And the gun's not real. <laughs> it looks real, we keep taking it off him, but he still buys another one. <laughs> and honestly, 
He only wanted a packet of cigarettes. <laughs> he says, do you want to prosecute him? Prosecute him? You know, I want to go home to bed. I'm alive. I thought we were going to die. Okay, you think I'd have lunch guns, but um, the next adventure was I joined the UDR. It was affiliated to the British Army. It was the Ulster Defence Regiment. And anybody could join it. The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker joined it. Uh, you did one week's basic training and you became a soldier. <laughs> and nobody ever failed this. You know, I mean, <laughs> we're halfway through your training. Um, I'm outside our tin hut that we sleep in, in the, on the army camp, and um, I hear the explosion in, in the distance. And then I hear another explosion in the distance. And a few minutes later, a regular soldier runs past and says, Get everyone out of the hut. The IRA are mortar bombing the camp. <laughs> I, I'm, my mouth's very dry. <laughs> I run into the hut and say to everybody, We've got to get out. The IRA are mortar bombing the camp. And they will laugh. And the ladder dies down, and there's another much louder explosion. <laughs> and we all get out of that frequency. <laughs> the outcome of the IRA attack on Ballykinner Army Camp was most of the mortars landed on the wrong side of the perimeter fence in farmers' fields, and a couple of it over the perimeter fence and blew holes in the football pitch. It wasn't very successful. Uh, we, uh, <coughs> another little aside to the being in the during our week's training was, uh, you do, the first thing we would like, we were on the right of range, learning how to shoot, and um, there was one particular guy, he couldn't shoot. Every time he pulled the trigger, the bullets went left, right, up, down, and never went straight in front of him. They took him out every day to teach him how to do it. Uh, we get to the end of the week, we get our pass out, we pass out, and we become soldiers. <laughs> And um, you turn up for your first tour of duty, you, your tour of duty was 8 o'clock at night to 8 o'clock in the morning. So when you go to the army, you get your rifle, you get your bullets, and I was with the guy that couldn't shoot. And they gave him his rifle, but they never gave him any bullets. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, okay, I, I leave the UDR because my father's bought a pub and I'm going to run it. The pub was in a small market town about that's the pub. It's about, you know, that's where we are. Um, about 15 miles in and from Newcastle. Our best customers were the police. Uh, and they seemed to have a sixth sense as to when the pub was empty. And I got all my customers out. So one particular night, I got everyone out. Uh, I'm doing the till, there's a knock on the door. He said, uh, I go up, open the door, there's a squad car outside, with two policemen at the door. They come in get themselves a drink, throw their sterling submachine guns in the bar, which they always did. It was pretty weird looking. And in the space of half an hour, I had 12 policemen in the bar. There was two armoured landowners and two squad cars outside. And they were having a great time, as they say, you know, and the crack was nighty. I was having a miserable time, I wasn't going to go to bed. But anyway, there's another knock at the door. Uh, it's another policeman. And he's, he's on his feet, but he said he can't walk. He's absolutely pissed. You know, he's in his uniform, doesn't make any difference in our part of the world. Uh, he comes into the bar, and all the other policemen don't really like him. And he doesn't get on with anybody. He, well, he comes in, he finds a wall, and like, you know, he's so drunk, he leans against the wall and puts his feet out so he doesn't fall over. And the other guys ignore him. He doesn't ask me for a drink, they don't offer him a drink. He just stands there and looks around. And what does he do? He pulls out his notebook and he pulls out a pen. <laughs> and he says, right, I'm booking you all for drinking after hours. <laughs> and you're in uniform. <laughs> and see that publican? He'd probably go to jail. The one policeman was more annoyed than the other. I've now got 12 very angry policemen. One was more annoyed than the other. He went up to him and he grabbed him by the lapels and he was something him against the wall. And then uh, the very drunk one was slashing him in the side of the ribs and they started to brawl in the bar. All the other guys said, no, come on, they pulled him out onto the street. 
and they were brawling on the street. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> um, eventually, they roll, they fall over and they're rolling the street, and all the other guys are right there with this, around them in a circle, and uh, they pull them apart, and uh, they throw the very drunk one in the back of the squad car at the front door, and they all come back into the bar, and they order another round of drink, and I get them another round of drink, and then they say to me, John, would you away or do you keep an eye on them? <laughs> okay, so I'm standing at the door of the bar, keeping an eye on them, but I see him trying to get out, his child's locked in the back of the car. They have left a sterling submachine gun in the back of the car. <laughs> Horrible weapon. And I hear a sound that chills my blood. I don't know if you know anything about guns. He cocked the weapon, pulled the bolt back, put a bullet up the breech, and if you touch the trigger in that gun, it just empties the magazine and it sprays bullets everywhere. I get quickly into the bar, stand behind a very thick wall, <laughs> and say to the guys what he's done. And they were actually quite nonchalant. Four of them went out, two of them in the front, two of them in the back, and they wrestled the gun off him. Now, it did not go off. If it went off, it would have probably be international news. Police men kill each other outside a bar at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it did not go off. They locked the car at the front as well. They come back into the bar and they order another round of drink. <laughs> and say to me, John, I'll wait out and keep an eye on him. So I go out, I can't see him. I go out to see him in the car. I can't see him walk over his car. He slouched over the back seat. He's asleep. <laughs> Thank you, folks, for listening to my mishaps in Northern Ireland. <laughs> Just a few. A few. Uh, it sounds like fun, but it wasn't. You know, there's the statistics of what happened in Northern Ireland. Thank you very much.